All right. Well, let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this new day. And we thank you for the chance to meet together again on this Sunday morning and to continue to read through uh, the book of Romans and all of the complexity and history that this book has brought um, through the ages. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom as we, as we look into it, as we discuss it, as we ask it questions, as it challenges us. And we pray, Lord, that you would watch over us as we do so. So hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I know already I have to move this mic. Okay, Romans 7, very famous chapter. We talked about last week this reality of why the, why the chapter is so contested. Uh, well, maybe we'll start with the, we'll start reading at verse 14. Uh, let's see what, what, Bible version do we want to use? For we know that the law is spiritual. We'll add the drawing. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold into slavery to sin. Now this I am right here is the cause of great conversation and consternation because of everything that's come in the book so far. We want to know if this is this I am is before what Christians call regeneration or after regeneration. What do I mean by regeneration? We don't use that term very often. It's a it's a it's a term classically used with Christianity. Yes, yes. The, the, the question is whether Jesus in our lives makes an effective difference. And in chapter 6, we looked at all of this discussion about the old nature dying in baptism and new life coming about. Martin Luther said, um, Adam is drowned in the waters of baptism, but Adam is a strong swimmer. <laughs> the reason Luther was so popular and just such an amazing author, he, he had a real gift for these little sound bites. Adam is drowned in the waters of baptism, but Adam is a strong swimmer. And the way this is set up here is the question, well, are we regenerate or aren't we? And so we have, let's say one poll is not. Another poll is R, and here you have the question, what's the relationship between these two things? Because our experience with Christians and Paul's conversation with Christians has always been, he's got this sort of duality with which he speaks with letters to the church of, uh, in Galatia, to the Christians in Corinth. On one hand, he says, they are made new in Christ. They are a new creation. And then he goes about basically telling them how terribly they're falling short and encouraging them to move along this pattern. And that lets that basically gets us into many religious traditions where you basically have the way things are and the way things should be. And many religious traditions try to move people. Well, many religious traditions, that's really broad. Because religion, religion itself is very, very much more diverse than we imagine it to be in our context because Christianity has had such a profound and transformative impact in the world over the last 2,000 years that almost every religious tradition that you will find in a place like America has been shaped by Christianity at a fundamental level. And, and you can notice this when you read, let's say, the ancients, 
because part of what religion was in many ways was simply ceremony and you pacify the gods or you bribe the gods by your religious observances and practices and the one of the things that the bible does and the old testament prophets do and i i have this conversation a lot with many of my new jewish friends is the old testament begins with these sacrifices but you not only have sacrifices but you have this covenant which very much details how life should be led and as the conversation within the old testament develops you have these hebrew prophets saying things like um basically i desire other things besides sacrifices and this is a real departure from almost all of the other religions in the ancient near east where the big thing was sacrificial practice and ceremony and whereas so you could boy i'm going to get in trouble for this cuz <laughs> so you basically have ancient near east religious practice where ceremony and sacrifice and observance and behavior is absolutely paramount and then you have the bible the old testament prophets where the conversation goes to okay you can sacrifice all you want but if your heart and if your life is not in alignment with me you'd be better off not sacrificing and and then when you get to let's say paul in the new testament that's almost exactly what he says to the corinthian church with respect to the lord's supper unless your relationships with one another are in a better condition you would be better off stopping your lord's supper practices completely and so in that way paul is very much and again I, one of my friends is going to let me know this in the comment section paul is going to almost mimic what the ancient hebrews said with respect to that and part of what if you follow this continuum on let's say to atheism atheism basically says church observance none of that matters certain kind of atheists have reduced it just to whatever nub usually sort of a some inheritance from christianity that they've picked up on which is loving your neighbor so you have love god and love your neighbor loving god goes away completely because they're skeptical about there being any god so now it's just love your neighbor and um let's say you have the protestant um reformation in here which very much addressed the medieval roman catholic church in a similar way to what the old testament prophets addressed their people with respect to the temple and i mean this in a sense is the heart of tom holland's book dominion and his critique he said christianity has within it this very strident critique this moral this this image of moral improvement and you know sort of where we're at in this in the contemporary church is realizing that okay so the atheists say you don't need to go to church at all oh okay because there is no god oh okay but then you begin to realize what's happening in their lives and there's a drift they might have started say with a christian moralism or some some vestige of christian morality but with successive generations they find it difficult to sustain which leads us back into well right now sort of a psychological argument that well maybe in order to sustain the moral behavior you need a much richer symbolic practical engagement with god than just good intentions of moral improvement okay
So again, and all what this does for us is put us on the horns of this dilemma in verse 14, asking the question, what is Paul talking about? Because Christians and non-Christians for centuries have read the remainder of chapter 7 and said, I can identify with this. And I will regularly find atheists who at least have still with them a degree of Christian knowledge, partly because there there also often seems to be something of a cycle. Um, A lot of people believe that atheism would be a a terminal destination and that religion would go away. You know what they've discovered? They've been saying this for a hundred years. Religion's not going away. In fact, it seems like on a multi-generational perspective, you have Christians and their children becoming increasingly atheistic, often with maybe successive generations falling into greater moral decay and successive generations coming back to the faith. You see this regularly because, and a lot of the conversation on the internet now with the likes of Tom Holland and Mary Harrington and Louise Perry and Douglas Murray and a whole, usually people out of the UK because secularization is quite a bit deeper and quite a bit longer in the UK than it is here, is that these people who grew up basically without much of any Christian practice or very nominal practice begin to say, maybe there is something to church. Maybe there is something to being raised in the faith. Maybe this very practical devotional formation is essential to exactly what Paul is talking about here, which is achieving the good practices that we all know and wish to achieve. So, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly sold into slavery to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Because what I want to do, this I do not practice. But what I hate, this I do. And this verse 15 right here, go ahead and find a your favorite atheist and ask them if they can relate to this verse. And they will say yes. And then go and find a Christian who does all of the Christian practices faithfully who has been working in their life to strive self-consciously to embody Christ in their life, they will read this verse and they will say, I can very much feel what Paul is saying. And that's what puts us on the horns of this dilemma, because then we have to ask the question, is Christ effective? And I think Because of what we've seen, especially in the last 100 or 200 years, there are a great many people out there that say things like, well, I don't necessarily believe what the Christians believe, but I like having my neighbors be Christian. This goes all the way back to Voltaire, one of the early modern atheistic, is he atheist or is he a deist? It's tough to know with Voltaire. But, you know, That's what Voltaire said. I want my shopkeeper to be a Christian. I want my servant to be a Christian. I want my neighbor to be a Christian. Why? Because all of this belief helps them achieve moral betterment. They fear God. And so you know what? Even though atheists like Sam Harris might say, oh, these Christians are so burdened and beleaguered with hellfire and damnation. And it's like, eh, I don't really find a lot of that. There is some. But Christians do concern themselves with pleasing God. And that desire to please God 
spurns them on to often doing things they don't feel like doing, but they want to do. And so you see this. Go ahead, Carol. It also makes them easier to relate to other people. It gives them the ability to uh, be easier to associate with. It makes, it makes who easier to relate to whom? It makes the neighbor a more pleasant person okay. to Voltaire. It makes the neighbor a more pleasant person to Voltaire. Right. The neighbor is living under an ethic, following a master who says, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. Now, Christians very often fall short of that standard, but that standard is still out there. So I was, this week, um, I did some work on a woman named Megan Phelps Roper. Megan Phelps Roper was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church. Do any of you remember Westboro Baptist Church? Okay, Carol does. Yes. So in the in the West in the 1980s and and 90s, the Westboro Baptist Church would go to military funerals. That's not in the 1980s, it's in the 2000s after 9-11, it's in the aughts. They would go to military funerals of people who died in the war in Iraq and protest about homosexuality. And they got a lot of press because of this. And they were, they were in some ways the most hated group in America because of what they did. And they'd have these big signs, God hates, you know, these derogatory names. And they were doing this and they were getting a ton of press. This Westboro Baptist Church is one tiny little church. And I think most of us, myself included, thought this is just some tiny little hateful, awful little community that is doing this terrible thing. Well, as it turns out, Megan Phelps Roper was raised in that church and she eventually got on Twitter in order to continue to try to propagate what that church was doing as a young adult and eventually decided to leave the church. The church was in some ways just this family little church and her fa- her grandfather was the founding pastor. But we, w- we would think that these were all just sort of ignorant, backwards people. No, most of the people in the church were lawyers. They were very well educated and it was basically an extended family. And as she describes growing up, it was a it was a wonderful group of people, how they treated each other with love. They were well raised. They weren't homeschooled. They went to public school. They watched movies. She herself was a big Harry Potter fan. But they were on this one point, these smart lawyers wanted to move the needle in the country with respect to a bunch of social political things. And they said, you know the way to really get attention? This is how. And they were right. And and, and so in, in many ways, they were very moral. But then when she was, and they were very, very much devoted to the Bible, and she would read the Bible, but there would be these verses in the New Testament, things that Jesus would say, like, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And she was reading the Bible with her grandfather once, and you know they're going out and doing these protests. And so she told her grandfather, she said, wait, wait, wait a minute. What about this verse? And her grandfather kind of pushed it away. But then her father picked it up and said, you know, your grandfather sort of um, saying that this verse, we shouldn't really practice this verse. That doesn't really count. Because again, there were fundamentalist Christians that really read the Bible and really, and, and there was stuff in the Bible itself that undermined what they were doing. And over time, you never hear about them anymore. The church has changed quite a bit. She's left the church. She's now, again, when asked about her religious, you know, do do you practice a religion? No, but I wouldn't be surprised if this practice doesn't happen again with someone like her because Jesus is the foundation for this gnawing insecurity about 
about what we assume, how we assume to change people. So at the 11 o'clock service, I've never gotten as much. I'll talk about it in the sermon today because my rough draft really caused some um, attention in the comment section about how I use a certain word. And we'll talk about it at 11 o'clock. But Jesus remains, and the Bible remains, this text that sort of undermines these these facile certainties and and continues to strive, uh, people to strive towards, well, becoming better. And again, Jesus radically altered our definition of better. And so, verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand because what I want to do, this I do not practice. But what I hate, this I do. But if what I do not want to do, this I do, I agree that the law is good. Now, again, we've talked a lot about the use of law here. And we talk about law number one and law number two. One way to say law number one, people in the modern period sometimes call it natural law. Actually, when Origen, ancient church father, deals with this passage, that's um, that's how he understands this. But earlier on, we talk, again talk, talked about the Mosaic Code, and and part of part of what's been super interesting for me in my conversations with a lot of contemporary Jews, both in America and Israel, has been watching how they, you know, watching, learning a little bit about how that code works into their communities. And it's it's very interesting how, how this stuff develops. Verse 17, but now I am no longer the one doing it, but sin that lives in me. And so in verse 17, Paul sort of once again engages, so baptism, is the drowning of the old self. And then you have the law of sin and the law of righteousness. And so in verse 17, Paul again sort of reminds us of what he had been teaching in chapter 6. But he holds that tension for us. For I know that good does not live in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Now we're going to get into this. This word in Greek is sarx. Sometimes we talk about it with flesh. And in some ways there's... We can even have a flesh number one and a flesh number two because Paul uses this word in different subtle ways at different times. Okay. So, and and some of that travels in travels with us into English. So if I use the word flesh, how do we understand it? What are some of the definitions? Okay, skin. Or, well, sometimes skin specifically, this is flesh. And in fact, part of what has happened with language over time, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, language over time continues to differentiate. Because there are, language continues to grow over time. So one of the things that we would never say now in English was not uncommon to say, let's say, during Lent, Catholics no longer, during Lent, Catholics abstain from eating flesh. Now, if I were to say that in the streets of California today, people, that's right. Are you saying Roman Catholics are cannibals? No, I'm not. But. In older English, flesh was basically meat. Now, it's really interesting because 
the definition of, oh, here's a question, is fish meat? Ah, see, we have another word for it. Because during Lent, Roman Catholics who are observing some traditional practices won't eat beef or pork or chicken, but they will eat fish. And to me, meat, fish is meat. But older versions of the language say there's fish and then there's meat. That's a really good question. I really have no idea. That, that's the thing that comes to me. Right. The lady that helps me clean is Catholic, and she was saying how she had to um, fast on Good Friday. Yep, yep. You know. Yep. And um, I, I started thinking about it, and I wondered perhaps it could be from Jesus feeding the multitude with Unlimited bread. It could be. And and part of this gets into even the definition of fasting. For example, I mean, the month of Ramadan is around this time of year. Well, fasting for them means not eating during daylight hours, but then eating at night. So that's fasting for them. Um, when I, you know, at now, again, through my strange new life with online, I know a lot of Orthodox people and often when they are fasting, they are vegetarians. So that's fasting for them and fasting during Lent for Roman Catholics means not eating flesh. Um, <laughs> so not eating meat, certain categories. So there's a lot that goes on here. So one definition of flesh is skin or meat. What's another definition of flesh? Okay. Body is a complex word. Which sense of body? Okay, but that's sort of the skin because there's this other sense, which is, let's talk about hunger. How does hunger relate to flesh? Because hunger, you might say, I have a hunger or an appetite for, f ah, it can be an emotion for food, for sex, for glory, for money. It, flesh can sometimes mean this acquisitive, desiring, hungering. And what's the relationship between that and the body, let's say? Yes, they do. They go hand in hand. Right. You and And so when you get into something like fasting, fasting has traditionally been... A, now, there's again, there's two sides of fasting. One might be rule-based. The God says, don't eat during, don't eat these things during this period of time. That's sort of legal compliance. A more psychological justification for fasting might be you need to learn, you need to discipline your flesh so that you are not controlled by your flesh. And when you look at what Paul is saying here, for I know that good does not live in me, that is, in my flesh. Hmm. See, you can see why we're, well, what exactly do you mean, Paul, that good doesn't live in your flesh? Because Part of what happens among different religious traditions is you read something like this, and let's say the Gnostics, the Gnostics, and this is a big conversation, but generally speaking, the Gnostics had a thing about materiality. 
The Gnostics and many other traditions like them looked around and said, made the observation that, similar to what C.S. Lewis made, and that all loves die of betrayal or death, but love itself does not die. You have this differentiation between below in the world of matter and flesh, things decay. You go to the store and buy some meat and go home and put it on the counter, very quickly, it will start to smell bad. Say, well, I'm going to keep it longer. Put it in the fridge. It'll last longer, but it will decay. Ideas don't decay. And so one of the very early philosophical ideas was ideas must be of higher value than material things. And you can read the New Testament in a way that sort of agrees with that. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust consume. Lay up treasures in heaven where there's no decay. And these ideas traveled all the way through the Middle Ages in many respects. And so, make sure I didn't pull anything out here. No, oh, it still works. Um, these ideas traveled, and so one could get to the point of saying something like, well, Jesus, when he was in the flesh, was less God than Jesus after he was killed. And that's the whole idea behind the Gnostic Gospels. And so when you read a verse like this, now I know that good does not live in me, but that is in my flesh. So Gnostics would read this and say, oh, well, here's the way you get around this. Get out of your body. Then you won't decay. Is that what Paul's saying? Not really in accordance with everything else he says, but he's been read that way. So it seems to me that it's much more along the lines of that this sin in us, and again, we talked about sin in three different ways. We talked about Mark missing, we talked about rebellion, and we talked about corruption. And there are more ways to do it than just these three, but Sin takes the law and corrupts it with rebellion in order to achieve something. And, and I think this is the sense, quite clearly, of what Paul is talking about. For the willing is present in me. Ostensibly, I say, I want to be like Christ, but I don't act like it when, well, when what? And I think many of us understand this. When? What are often the conditions by which we fail to achieve the noble goals that we ostensibly and verbally say we want to achieve? What are some of the kinds of things that defeat us? Fear. Right? We get afraid. We get afraid of losing something. So then, what are some of the things people do when they get afraid? You work with them all the time. I deny. deny, lie, deny, violence, uh, avoid. There's another one. Um, I mean, just based on fear, you can have a whole laundry list a really lousy behavior, and, and, and fear what? Well, sometimes fear for their own physical safety. It, you know, we have in our legal code this understanding of self-defense. If you have a reasonable amount of fear for your bodily safety, you are legally justified to do violence. It's this really weird exception where we sort of want to say that the state has a monopoly on violence, but if you have fear for your life, 
you are able to do violence against an aggressor. Now, it's got to be proportional, <laughs> and the courts will hold you accountable to that, but fear is a big one. Um, you know, I'm going to say lust, but I don't mean just sexual lust. Really, the, the better word is um, avarice, and it's much more like hunger. It's, it's the desire to acquire. Addictive behavior, yes. Or or just um or just greed. Greed doesn't even have to be addictive to be evil. Self-centeredness. Um, so and, and what's interesting is that even just the difference between fear, fear might be motivated because you are jealous for a good thing. Um, and lust, which is fear is almost a pulling back, and avarice is almost a moving towards. But but all of these are very connected to the flesh, and, and this is where some of those categories sort of come together, because it could mean hunger, it could mean self-preservation, but, but it almost always has to do with materiality something in the instantiated world that shouldn't be lost. And, and again, um, hunger itself isn't a bad, this is where, this is where Christians differ, begin to differentiate themselves from the Gnostics because the Gnostics, some Gnostics might be tempted to say hunger is a sign of evil. And Christians would say hunger is a sign of your desire for a good thing. That good thing might be food. That good thing might be um, might be the goods that that rightly come along with sex. Um, that good thing might be uh, excellence in reputation or performance or all these things. Those are all good things, and and that's why this word is so tricky. And that's why in this verse it's so tricky because on one hand, our hunger and desire for these things are not bad. But within us, the dance is so subtle that even legitimate fear or legitimate desire can so easily become contaminated and we lose our way. For the good that I want to do, I do not do, but the evil that I do not want to do, I do. And again, there's another verse where you can go to an atheist and say, I'm going to read this, I'm going to read this sentence to you and tell me if this fits with your experience. The good that you want to do, um, you don't do, but the evil that you don't want to do, you do. And I'd say atheists all the way to famous atheists like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins would say, yes, I can agree with that kind of sentiment. They go to a Christian and they'll say, yes, I want to do more good. I want to do less evil. And that's why you have the Christian practice of confession. But if what I want to do, I do not, but if what I do not want to do, this I am doing, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin that lives within me. Oh boy. See, there's a reason why this verse is so hard. Because Paul is now differentiating me from the sin that is dwelling in me and the righteousness that is dwelling in me, and you have the sharp line of baptism that is supposed to differentiate this. And so Paul basically sets this whole thing up and says, in Christ, there is a me that is better than the me you see. Now, you've got to be really careful with this stuff because Almost any good thing in this world is able to be corrupted and perverted and in the long history of Christianity has been. And, and in fact, you can find these things in the very ancient world already. 
And you can find early Christian groups that said, there's me is split up into my body and my soul. Now my body can be as libertine, as abusive, as my body can, I can do with my body whatever my body pleases. Because the real me is my soul. And my soul is saved even if my body is just pursuing its appetites. Now, that is a minority position among Christians as it always has been, but it shows up. And it shows up regularly and repeatedly. And it shows up in various Christian traditions with various theological justifications. But the majority of the Christian of, of the Christian community has looked at this and said, no, we can't be split that way. And Paul certainly will have nothing of it. He doesn't treat the Galatians in that way, and he doesn't treat the Corinthians in that way. But this shows up, and it shows up because you can read this verse and think, oh, well, so I'm just going to enjoy, I'm just going to indulge in what my flesh desires and my soul will stay separate. Nope. Well, that's right. Well, and, but but again, I mean, we have to be careful of the other side. I mean, Tertullian very same famously said that um, being a Christian is like riding a horse. <laughs> And you always you you always fall off on one side or the other. The one side is legalism, and the other side is antinomialism, which basically means libertinism, lawlessness. And he's like, it's so hard as a Christian to not become legalistic, because when you say you're only doing what you want to do, okay, but. By virtue of my new life in Christ, I should want to do what I should do. So wanting itself isn't the problem. It's, 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 it's this new life in me, this new growing righteousness that should be the goal, whereas the opposite of what Paul is complaining about, now the good I do, the good I want to do, I actually do. And the evil I don't want to do, I no longer do. And hopefully, as we grow in the Christian life, that comes to fulfillment. Consequently, I find the principle with me, the one who wants to do good, that evil is present with me. Now, so not only have... Lately, I've been wondering when this would happen. So you get on the internet and you usually sort of start with the people closest around you. And so my initial audience tended to be Christians, um, deconstructed Christians, spiritual but not religious, and atheist, kind of what you'll find in our normal lives. And then over the last couple of years, more and more conversations with Jews. That's been really interesting. Um, here locally, uh, one of my good friends, Raj, is Sikh. And so relationship with him. You know, our neighbor right over here, um, you know, Sam, he's Hindu. So here in Northern California, you're going to begin have relationships with lots of different people. And so over the last couple of years, the Jews have been um, more and more active in the channel. And so more and more conversations with them. Lately, more and more Muslims have been sort of coming into the picture. And, you know, one of the, and these, these particular brands of Muslims that have been coming into the picture have been, one postures her, herself as a, sec, for secular Koranism, which basically says, you, you could totally understand this in the West, well, I don't believe in, you know, maybe I'm skeptical about all of the supernatural God stuff, but what we should really do is follow Sharia law in the secular world. 
and others maybe are more accepting of some of the traditional um, ideas of Islam and Allah and all of that, but they're really excited and really advocating, well, what we have to do is really cut down on all of this sexual libertinism in the culture. Okay, I, I, a lot of conservative Christians, they're not going to argue with that. But the question is the means. What we really need is a lot of new laws. Oh, a lot of new laws. But let's, let's start with adultery, okay? What would happen if we made adultery illegal? So, oh, okay. What are the, what are the, what, how are you going to punish adulterers? There's the question. You're going to put them in jail? Are you going to cane them? Are you going to fine them? And, and, and what's going to constitute adultery? Yeah, suddenly you're at that question too. Is it flirting? Is it looking? Because, you know, you've got a lot of communities, especially some older religious traditions, that are all about actions. But Christianity has long had, and I'm not saying the other communities don't, so hear me say that, you comment makers. Um, <laughs> but Christianity, by virtue of what Paul writes here, has a long tradition of recognizing that adultery doesn't really begin when I'm sleeping with someone who isn't my wife. Now, that's an important line. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Because if someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm really struggling with desire for this person, my neighbor's wife, let's say, have you slept with her? No. In what ways have you acted on this? I haven't. And as a pastor, you say, it's a lot of damage that has not been done. Because at this point, it's probably mostly in your head. And well, let's, let's see if we can keep it in your head at least. <laughs> and not have it act out in your body. So, but, so Christianity has had a long time of dealing with this kinds of thing, and a lot of the reason we have is this chapter, and is the ambiguity and nuance in this chapter, where Paul recognizes that within him, there is a struggle. And the struggle within him is real and significant and ought to be taken seriously, but there are levels <laughs> of this struggle that are significant still. And so, okay, so people should be, people should behave better sexually. I agree. And we might even agree on the standard, which is people should have sexual relations with that group should be limited to those that they are, they are married to. Amen. Let's agree on that. The question is, how do you get there? And what's actually the most productive way to get there? Because you think, well, what would be wrong with having all of these laws? And I would say, there's actually a very long tradition of having all of these laws. And part of the reason some of these laws have been rolled back is because Sometimes certain laws in their application have been found to be counterproductive to the overall goal. And so what happens in a society over time, so we have a long conversation about the ideal and how to arrive there. Because it might be tempting to say, let's just have a lot of strict laws firmly enforced. Okay. But there are also a lot of damage that happens in, in such a way. And you can find that damage in other countries and at other times and places where and it's a complicated thing. I'll leave it there. Right. You can't legislate morality, even though all legislation is about morality. And, and so it's a difficult thing. And what you actually want to do, and again, I think this is an inheritance of Christianity, and I'll let the other groups argue about that within, with respect to their own traditions, but 
what you want to do is help people achieve morality with as little coercion as possible because the best morality is uncoerced morality from the exactly from the inside out not from the outside in and i think that is exactly what paul is addressing here he's saying that the kind of and you can find this in the bible the lord loves a cheerful giver what does that mean it means someone who gives the reason i talk about misery deliverance gratitude someone who gives out of gratitude rather than compulsion or fear or even lust because you can you can create a very religious moralistic community out of fear you can create a very moral community out of let's say appetite in some ways appetite for reputation that's what self righteousness is appetite for reputation the kind of morality you want is natural flexible um completely the will all of these things aligned towards a good goal and the question is how do we achieve that now when we get to Romans 13 Paul is going to say the state has been given the power of the sword it is good to put boundaries on the world because Actually, if there's no boundaries on the world, this kind of moral formation has difficulty in getting going. So prisons have their place. Government, coercion has its place. But one of the things that I think the United States and many other countries in the world wrestle with is getting down to the details of what should be coerced and what's best to leave sort of fluid and for example in the united states almost everyone will agree adultery is a bad thing but most people will agree that the police shouldn't come and arrest adulterers and lock them up for a year or two for adultery they see that as counterproductive because what you really are looking for is not avoiding adultery what you really want is faithfulness. And you can't really legislate faithfulness. <laughs> you can legislate compliance, but not faithfulness. And I think a lot of this comes as a result of what Paul writes right here. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in my inner person, but I observe another law in my members at war with the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that exists in my members. So now again, I mean, that word member can mean something rather sexual. And, and, and Paul is making the point here that this all of this struggle with appetites and fear and it's a deeply psychological passage and people have been reading this passage in that way for a very long time and i think that's the best way to read it paul says within me there is a war but christ is within me fighting this war wretched man that i am who will rescue me from this body of death thanks be to god through jesus christ our lord so Paul holds the tension from verse 14 to 24. And I think we have been blessed by the fact that he holds the tension there, even though Christians fight about this. He holds the tension there so that both Christians and non-Christians can look at this and say, this is my psychological, this is my experiential this is how I experience the war within me. Christians and non-Christians can feel that war. And he looks to Jesus Christ as his Savior for that. So then I myself with my mind am enslaved to the law of God, but my flesh I am enslaved to the law of sin. 
And so now we have this anthropology, which is a splitness. Now, um, one of my favorite Tim Keller sermons, he did a trio of sermons on Romans 7 and 8. And what I really loved about his sermon on this was um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And there are lots of movies about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and most of them don't actually get at what Robert Louis Stevenson's book gets at. Robert Louis Stevenson's book on this, you can find it on the internet. It's been out there in the world a long time. And if you read the book instead of watching the movies, you'll see something. And Tim Keller saw it. So, so the story, everybody knows the story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So Dr. Jekyll was a man in this British community known for his great moral reputation. He was law-abiding in himself. He was benevolent to the poor. He did all of these things. And now this is in the 19th century where there's a lot of optimism about what science could do. Dr. Jekyll wanted to become more moral still. And so he decided to develop a potion by which he could perfect himself. And what he did with this potion is he split himself. And what he did with his potion was, when he would take this potion, all of his evil would go into Mr. Hyde, which would make Dr. Jekyll more moral. Did it work? No. In fact, it degraded them both, obviously. And, and so this is, this is part of, I think, the deep Christian tradition that recognizes that finally, this is so hard to talk about because there's so much to it and the nuances and distinctions are so subtle that, that finally we are delivered and we can't do this with, this, this has to come from the inside, as we said before. And, and there is a, you know, you think about, let's say, the alcoholic who wants to stop drinking and the alcoholic who develops a program, and you'll find this with a lot of alcoholics. Okay, I'm no longer going to visit this friend anymore because this friend always leads me astray. And I'm no longer going to visit this shop anymore because this shop always leads me astray. And I'm now no longer going to indulge in this habit anymore. Now, this habit might in itself not be a bad thing, but it always sends me down a bad path. And, and the alcoholic figures out all of this, these new little legalisms in order to curb themselves, but they also understand that they can't get it give into legalism itself. Because legalism itself will also send them down a bad road. And so it's this such a subtle nuance back to, I think it was Tertullian and, and the horse, back to trying to walk this way. And so Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a wonderful book to read in terms of, oh, dealing with the flesh is not such an easy thing. And I think we see this in Paul. And so I just want to tip into Romans 8 a little bit because Romans 8 very much follows on Romans 7. Whereas... Romans 7 is this passage that is so hotly debated. Romans 8 is this passage that is so overwhelmingly celebrated. And I think the two things are connected for that reason. And, and it gets into the fact that, again, part of, part of why a number of years ago I started Misery, Deliverance, Gratitude in my sermons is that, of course, is the shape, overall shape of the Heidelberg Catechism, but it also, I think, nicely shows a certain trajectory, and it's actually sort of a, a virtuous cycle can be that 
to, to try to defeat self-righteousness. We all have a sense that self-righteousness is ugly and poisonous to the path of growing in virtue because nobody likes a self-righteous person because self-righteous people may succeed with moral performance in a certain register, but they fail with what all of that moral performance is designed to pursue, which is love. In other words, they don't swear, they give money away, they are not adulterous. But the different, the goal of avoiding adultery is not sexlessness. It's fidelity. It's love. The goal of all of these things is love. And what self-righteousness does is makes, is takes all of this law and turns it against love. And, and so Paul is recognizing here, and Christ displayed it often. I mean, he looked at the, in some ways, the moral performers, and he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, what do you mean by that? These people are performing morally to a high degree. And Jesus says, there is a level up from there, which is what all of this points to, which is love. Figuring out how to love beyond mere compliance and conformity, very difficult. But that's where we're pointing to. Okay? All right. So next week, on to chapter 8. Let's pray. Lord, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers that are inside and outside of us. And so help us, Lord, to, to love the goal and to be made perfect by you. Lord, all of us fall short of loving you and loving our neighbor as perfectly as we should. And Lord, the law can be a, a useful tool in helping us to love because the world is large and complex and we need structures. But Lord, all of this is in pursuit of a relationship that we are all just beginning to attend to. So help us, Lord, to grow in love and help us, Lord, to grow in obedience. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen.